Good afternoon, everyone. Great, great. Um, first, let me thank um, Dr. Ayala for starting off. Uh, my task is to sort of step back and give you about a 30, 35,000 foot look about what you might be able to do to address disparities. And in prepping um, for this with Dr. Ayala, we talked about um, actually having her give an example that disparities can be reduced to start it off right off the bat. Uh, very often when I've given this talk, um, folks say, well, that's really interesting, Dr. King, but can you really make a difference on disparities? There's so many different factors involved. And I thought it would be helpful with Dr. Ayala's example to show that, yes, uh, to borrow a phrase, you can reduce disparities, and it is something that can be done. And, and so now I'm going to sort of step back and give you a, a broader context of thinking about some frameworks of how you might approach reducing disparities and tie it into some of the work that we did for the strategy forum. Uh, from the Millbank paper, some of you may have had a chance to look at. So, let me. Okay, great. So, I'm going to try very hard to stay on time so that uh, we can make sure we get to the QA because I, I find that's, that's usually the time that um, most of the interesting conversations happen and really a chance for you to have some of your questions answered. So I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. Uh, the one claim or I'll, disclaimer I'll put out is in your slide deck, there are going to be more slides in your handout than actually what I put up here. I did that intentionally so that you have some of the data, but wanted to make sure that it was truncated enough that we can get to the Q&A. Right. So quickly, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of understanding the evidence, uh, preparing for action and framing the issue. Um, what can you actually do about disparities? and then some potential frameworks and strategies. And I'll, I'll get into more detail about why I'm framing it that way. Uh, you guys know the population numbers. I threw this in there specifically because very often when we talk about the changing demographics, uh, we also forget that there's a language component to it and that even currently 51% of the U.S. population have limited functional health literacy. So this is not an issue of just uh, changing demographics, more African Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, et cetera. We're actually dealing with a translational literacy issue. They're, we're developing a population that is very different in terms of how they communicate with the rest of us in society. Now, what are some of the, res the things that might be responsible for disparities? And the truth is the jury is still out on this. Uh, a number of folks are, have proposed that there are some biological differences. Some of you may have seen some of the genetic pieces and genetic work that's out there. Um, truth is probably once you kind of sift through some of the genetic information and research that we're probably more alike than we are different. And the truth is probably there's more difference within racial and ethnic categories than there is between categories. Um, there's also the idea of the impact of social determinants, the things in our environment. And I'll show you a visual, visual example of that. Um, the question of access to care, um, and I'll talk about that briefly. And then what are some of the factors within the healthcare system? And Dr. Ayala touched on some of those. So I put this in very often because when we talk about disparities, particularly when I'm talking to policymakers, the first thing they say is it's all about access. We're going to get more access. We're going to get more hospital health, more community health centers, et cetera. But when you look at the IOM report, even patients with insurance doesn't explain the disparities that exist. So there's more things going on. And I throw this in there just so that we don't only focus on access, but we think about this as a very multifactorial, very complex issue that probably has different layers that we need to uh, peel apart to be able to really make a difference. So in terms of potential points of intervention, um, you can choose one. Diversity of the workforce, looking at cultural competence. Uh, Dr. Ayala talked about quality of care, trying to improve quality of care for everyone, the environment, data collection. And I throw this in there just so that folks get a sense that there are multiple, multiple ways that this probably can be approached and thought about in terms of trying to reduce disparities. So when we look at, oh, that's interesting. When we look at our, uh, the visual component of the contributing factors of disparities, um, the way I try to explain it to folks is that think about it in two camps. There is the healthcare world and then there is the health world. If you think about health in the broader context of how uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, defines it, sort of not just the absence of disease but the well-being of an individual, it really is much broader than what happens within the healthcare world. And typically, uh, there's this whole series of interactions that happen for the family outside in the home, in the workplace, taking them to daycare, transportation issues, et cetera. And then there's what happens within the hospital or healthcare system. So when you're thinking about different ways to actually look at levers for change, there are multiple different factors. And there are the healthcare issues, 
and then there are the social determinants of health. And what's exciting now is that we're at a point in time of history where social determinants are starting to gain traction. Uh, for those that are very interested in that area, Robert Wood Johnson uh, actually just recently released a report on their Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and WHO also actually released a report on social determinants of health. Now people are starting to realize that if we're going to improve the health and well-being of populations, we can't just look at health care. So I'm going to talk about this in two chunks, as I described, sort of the health care side and then the health or public health side. Starting first with the health care side, all of you have heard of the Unequal Treatment Report. I'm not going to belabor the point, but really wanted to bring it up because in the report they give good ways of framing how to approach this if you're looking at health care disparities. So going through them very briefly, um, they talk about the health systems factors, the navigation. And Dr. Yala mentioned sort of they call them navigators now within hospitals. How do you find someone, for example, the cardiac care person she mentioned, that can help a person navigate through the complex health care system? And this was a quote from one of the focus group participants from the IOM report. Then there's the idea of the patient the provider level factors of communication. Uh, differences between patient and providers op, op, oh, excuse me, influence communications and clinical decision making. And there's the idea that um, clinical decision making factors, particularly around stereotyping and quality of care, are another way to impact it. So for example, very often the term, people often say to me, well, isn't stereotyping a major problem in contributing to disparities? Well, the truth is when you look at the social cognitive literature, uh, stereotyping is a normal human function. It's something that all of us do. The issue where it becomes a problem with disparities is when we have negative stereotyping. When someone has an idea of a general concept around a, a larger population and then they apply that to an individual, then that's when the disparities start to exist. And that's when people start getting treated differently. And that's when the whole cycle of things start to happen. Then around the area of quality of care, uh, as Dr. Ayala mentioned, is this idea of can we improve just how we provide care to everyone, the idea of lifting all boats. And even that, you'd be surprised when you go to a number of different hospitals how the quality of care will differ from hospital to hospital, even hospitals that are right down the street from each other. Um, the other piece of that, just as a caveat, which we started to find out more about this earlier in the year, is that even with quality improvement initiatives, not all quality improvement initiatives address disparities. There are actually QI initiatives that make disparities worse. Now the question is, why are they worse? There's something about how the initiative is either implemented, the approach, the intervention that's missing a piece that actually can make the disparities worse. So just as two points of thought as you get into developing strategies.